Gulf of Siam, Indochina, Malay Peninsula, South Asia. So from these nodal points, these maritime points, trade happened around the seas. And that space constituted Singapore's hinterland. It was not an overland hinterland. But in the late 19th century, as the British opened up Malaya through the discovery of tin and rubber, uh, they needed a staple port, a port through which the commodities extracted from Malaya, tin and rubber, could be processed and then extracted, and where a business um, structure could be built, credit, banks, exchange, and so on. So Singapore, at that time, became the most natural point. So it was then integrated with the Malay Peninsula by rail, by road, and other physical infrastructure. So it looked like Malaya had then become uh, a very natural uh, hinterland for Singapore. Now, the trade in Singapore was essentially entrepôt. Entrepôt means it's a, a transshipment kind of model. Singapore did not produce anything. There were no commodities in Singapore, and the population was so small that it did not constitute a market for any significant imports. All it did was that ships would come with big cargoes, then it would be unpacked on the smaller vessels, and the smaller vessels will move around the region to redistribute, and then they will bring goods back to Singapore, repack into other ships, and then they sail back to sail to China or to the Middle East or to England um, for distribution. So that was the role that Singapore played. It was more like a, a middleman, a transshipment center. And for that to happen, as I said, it had to uh, be open, it had to function with a very sort of um, loose, almost a leisure fair kind of a, uh, or organization where people could easily move in, settle, organize their work. And in fact, Singapore was then well known in that part of the world as a free port. There were no taxes, it was leisure fair, minimal intervention from the colonial state. All that was important was that there was always movement of goods. So that was Singapore. Now, as a result of its trade, Singapore also became the hub of many other activities. So it started to draw in immigration. Now, there was no indigenous population in Singapore at the time. It was, when the British came, uh, populated by some uh, Malay fishermen, by what they called the sea nomad, nomads, the Orang Laos, who sailed around the area, sometimes functioning as local militiamen, sometimes functioning as pirates. Um, but the point was that people started moving in, into Singapore at the time to work because a colonial port city was being built. So in the case of India, for instance, um, there was the, uh, Singapore became a part of a, a penal colony of sorts where um, manpower was needed to build the infrastructure, the municipal infrastructure. So uh, uh, some convicts were transported to Singapore and they spent um, maybe 10, 20 years and they built up many of the monuments in Singapore. But subsequently, there were other migrants who came from South Asia, businessmen uh, from all over South Asia, people who came to work in the security forces, police, the police and the, the local security, uh, tr traders, the Chetias came also to function to support the local economy in Singapore. And Singapore basically then started to grow as a result of this immigration. And as I said, um, it then got linked to Malaya to form part of its um, um, staple port functions. Now, Calcutta took a very different trajectory. Now, you, you, you people probably know more about the history of Calcutta than I do. So the, the, the difference is that um, Calcutta was a riverine port, a riverine market. It was not like Singapore located in a strategic sort of waterway. It was actually away from the coast, 200 miles away from the sea. But the point it was, it was a, 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 a site that the British found useful um, as trade started to develop um, with the world on the one hand and the interior of India, of northern India on the other. So Calcutta served as a very strategic node which connected the small ports, the bulking areas, um, the little uh, uh, riverine ports in northern uh, India where produce were being made. Um, cotton, jute, silk, sugar and so on. And then it connected that part to the larger world as a result of its function in the empire. So I mentioned Singapore as 
a transshipment area. One could see quite differently Calcutta as a gateway, as a gateway, because it provided the entry into the interior, the hinterland, and then the other way, the hinterland's goods, uh, the hinterland's goods flowed through Calcutta onto the larger world. Um, but Calcutta, unlike Singapore, was also an imperial city. It was also an imperial <coughs> city, and from there, I mean, the seat of government um, governed large parts of South Asia and then Southeast Asia as well, of which Singapore was a, a part. But because of its colonial, uh, uh, its function as a colonial port city, it developed also cosmopolitan culture. And there you saw uh, settlements of Armenians, Jews, Greeks, and Anglo-Indians settling around Calcutta. So in that sense, there was some similarity with Singapore. Now, as I said earlier, it functioned um, well because it was able to integrate its hinterland, its northern, in, uh, northern Indian hinterland, very effectively with the trade in, in, in the world outside. So this was the critical role that Calcutta played. And it was quite different, as I said, uh, from the role that Singapore played. So uh, the connections, the agglomeration of industries, um, and then the middleman role that many, many business houses in Calcutta um, sort of emerged uh, to facilitate that kind of trade really consolidated Calcutta's position as the premier port uh, of the empire. And when the Suez Canal was open and um, steamship started operating, Calcutta began to flourish as well because the volumes of trade just increased. Uh, it was interesting that uh, when Raffles landed in Singapore in 1819, founded Singapore, um, he sent a note to his bosses in London and he said that Singapore has the potential to become like Calcutta one day. So Calcutta was the gold standard. That was a benchmark. And he felt that, you know, Singapore could one day aspire to be like Calcutta. Now, the other thing about Calcutta is that, uh, before I go on, uh, it was also the point where uh, Indian migration, you know, left uh, the subcontinent. The, the main say, uh, point where, uh, you know, the, the labor, the troops and all these who migrated to different parts of the world sail from, from uh, outside to India to the other parts of the world. And there's a very interesting uh, phenomenon in Singapore where the local Sikhs, the Sikhs, are always referred to as Bengalis, Bengalis, you know, in the local dialect way of referring Bengalis. And I grew up calling them Bengalis because that's what everybody called the Sikhs. And then I tried to understand why. And then probably the reason is that they all sailed from Calcutta, right, to come to Singapore. And that's why they were called, they thought that they were from Bengal. They called them Bengalis and therefore they were called Bengalis. Or they were just clumped together as anybody who sailed out of, of Calcutta. Any Indian who left India was called a Bengali because basically they came from Bengal. So, so that's a kind of culture that basically that historical uh, uh, circumstances of those days created. So I just want to make um, three points about um, Singapore and Calcutta as port cities under colonial rule. So one is that they had similar trajectories as uh, subjects of the Br British East India Company and subsequently as crown colonies and so on. Um, and by, ver their, by their very nature, port cities had to be open. Um, they had to be in, uh, inclusive. They had to uh, welcome uh, migrants and influx of migrants or outflow and then um, connected to their hinterlands. I think that's a very important point, and this is something which I'm going to elaborate a little later on, how uh, hinterlands plays, play a, a critical part in the fortunes of the port cities of which they are a part. And then in the case of um, Singapore, it was strategic location. It was located at the tip of the uh, Malayan Peninsula, at the southernmost tip, in, if you want, of the Asian landmass. But it was also at a very strategic point of the uh, Straits of Malacca, and the Straits of Malacca connected um, the, the, the markets on the west to the markets of the east. And if you were to sail at a point in time, you had to go through the Straits of Malacca. You could go further south to the Sunda Straits, but that's too far south now. So the point is that location was very important in Singapore. Um, so the, 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 the British colonial state, as I said, adopted a very leisure fare approach. They did not invest a lot. I mean, they built infrastructure, but they just leveraged on the movements of goods. In the case of Calcutta, I think there was a lot of building um, by the East India Company and the construction of port facilities contributed to the establishment of Calcutta as a premier colonial port at that time. 
And the third point is that um, in Singapore, there was a transshipment um, kind of function at Singapore Plate, where else in the case of Calcutta, it was an imperial city, it was a political center up to a point, and then it was also the gateway, right, connecting the um, rest of the world into India or East, uh, Eastern India and the other way around as well. Now, that was the colonial history. I want to move now to 20th century transformation. What, ha what then happened and how did those critical years um, influence the future of these two cities? In the case of Singapore, it was a colonial port city linked um, for a while with the Malayan hinterland, but after the war, after the Japanese surrendered and the British returned to Singapore, they took Singapore out of, Malay out of Malaya. Why? The British wanted to settle Malaya first. They wanted to decide what to do with Malaya and they wanted to in introduce some political reforms to Malaya. Now, at that point in time, many of the states in Malaya were ruled by the Malay sultans. Uh, there were already immigra immigration of Chinese and Indian workers into Malaya, but the Malay population felt that they owned the country, that they were the legitimate sons of the soil or daughters of the soil, and that they should really be the rightful owners or the inheritors of the British after the British left. So the British decided to um, take Singapore, because at that time Singapore had a Chinese majority population, and by adding Singapore into, Malay, um, in, into Malaya, it would have um, affected the population mix. So they took Singapore out, and then they came up with a Malayan Union plan, which was adopted in 1946, which basically gave quite liberal immigration um, provisions for the Chinese and the Indians. In other words, if you have lived there for, say, two or three years, you could become a new citizen of the Malay state. And also, they decided to take powers away from the sultans or the Malay rulers. And there was, of course, a reaction to that. And this gave rise to Malay nationalism. This was a period where Malay nationalism rose, and the current, uh, well, they just lost power in Malaya, uh, Malaysia last year, the United Malay National Organization, AMNO, was born during that time uh, as an as a opposition to the Malayan Union scam, uh, scheme. But I mention this because that was a time when they took Singapore away from Malaysia, excise Singapore. Then the Malayan Union scheme was changed to a federation scheme, which is what is in place now. Um, the, the, the sultans continued to have power, there were stricter immigration policies just to appease the Malays, but there was a federation scheme. Singapore still remained out of Malaysia. So the point is that um, for a while, Singapore lost its hinterland. It, it lost its hinterland. It was for 30, 40 years part of the Malaysian hinterland, and connected by rail, connected by trade, connected by export, and suddenly it was taken up by the British. So basically, uh, Singapore decided, had to find a new hinterland. So for years after 1946, 47, the political ambition of the leaders as power was evolved to Singapore. Singapore enjoyed um, what I, call, I would call a transfer of power. There was no nationalist movement, there was no revolution, there was no mass-based nationalism. The British essentially prepared Singapore to take over power at some point in time, and therefore uh, Singapore was basically prepared for power. At that, at that time, all the political leaders wanted to return to Malaysia. They thought that you know that was a natural place. That was a natural place. Singapore had to go back to Malaya. In 1963, Singapore did go back to Malay Malaysia. It became part of the Malaysian Federation. Uh, Sabah, Sarawak, in the North Borneo Territory was integrated into the Federation together with Singapore. But this was a very short-lived arrangement. In two years, in 1965, Singapore was told to go for a whole host of reasons, political, ideological, personality, and so on. There was a lot of disagreement. There was a lot of disagreement, and Singapore had to go. So Singapore left its hinterland in 1965. So Singapore became a nation state, an independent city state. It lost its uh, northern hinterland, and it had to start looking around again for its hinterland. Now, Calcutta also went through uh, quite a traumatic experience uh, during that period. I mean, there was, uh, of course, at the onset of, uh, during the Second World War, several bombings that took place here, uh, which destroyed uh, much of the infrastructure, especially the port facilities. Calcutta was deemed a very strategic point, right? Too cl close enough to India, uh, close enough to China, and therefore the Japanese decided 
that you know this would be a staging this could be a staging post and therefore decided to destroy some of the things so there were a lot of bombings then there was the partition the partition of bengal and as a consequence of the partition calcutta lost a big part of its natural hinterland um, to Bangladesh. And with that, of course, the jute industry and so on. Uh, so some calculations suggested that at least 30% of its primary hinterland was lost as a result of partition. And then there were the other things associated with partition, refugees, the influx of refugees, and therefore creating uh, pressures on the infrastructure, on the um, uh, sort of support systems in the state. And this, in a way, set Calcutta back um, considerably as a result of these challenges. And of course, um, in, in 1921, or was it 1912? 21, right? It was uh, the, the political uh, capital shifted. It was a blow to Calcutta. And, and then, uh, after, after the war, and when manufacturing started to develop, I think the manufacturing base also started to shift further west and affected Calcutta. I had some figures here which I'll try to read um, if I can find them. The, 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 the sort of drop, the, the, the drop in terms of its uh, capacity, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of exports, was quite dramatic. Um, so all these um, had an impact of, uh, uh, on the development of Calcutta. And while Singapore, as I earlier mentioned, had developed um, very much against its will, essentially, it did not plan for it, it developed into a city-state on its own, a nation-state on its own, um, Calcutta became uh, a city within a state, right? And when you're a city within a state, um, you do not have the independence to do a lot of things you want. You are at the mercy of the state government, and you are also um, at the mercy of the federal government. And these were challenges uh, that Calcutta continued to face. So Singapore became a nation state in 1965. It is a sovereign state, and a sovereign state basically means that you have your own government, you have your own armed forces, and you can develop your strategy accordingly. But what Singapore has lost is also a hinterland. The Malaysian hinterland had been taken away in 1965. It was told to leave Malaysia. So what happened was that Singapore decided to recast its strategy and position itself as a global city state. So in 1972, uh, the government decided that it will position itself with a loftier ambition. It will not see itself as a Southeast Asian city. It will see itself as a global city, a global city with the world, the world as its hinterland. So this was to cast the ambition of Singapore to, in other words, position itself to trade with everybody, to trade with the world, to open up and connect um, with the all the possibilities that a global city uh, would be able to enjoy. Um, now, Saying that you're a global city is one thing, but um, deciding how you should prioritize your strategy, develop approaches, target markets is another thing. So somewhere along the line, um, the Singapore government also decided that we should try to frame another way of looking at our hinterland, and that's what he, uh, the former Prime Minister of Singapore called the seven-hour hinterland. In other words, you took a flight from Singapore, a seven-hour flight, you get to that point in the seventh hour, you draw a circumference, and you see these concentric circles, that would be the hinterland. And that hinterland, interestingly, would include China, Japan, India, Australia, all of Southeast Asia, and even um, to Russia. So the point is that this is a huge hinterland, and Singapore is constantly trying to create space for itself. The reason why I'm showing you this is that as a global port city that is now, not con as, that is now a city, it is not connected to any natural land mass and therefore, it always wants to define where its uh, natural hinterland would lay. And in these days of, well, travel by ship, travel by air, you can frame your hinterland in this manner. Calcutta, in a way, although it's, no lo it, it's a now a, state within, a, a city within a state, also needs to think of its hinterland. And the uh, reconstruction or the transformation of Calcutta will, to a large extent, be determined, in my view, on how it relates to its hinterland. And Calcutta has many uh, ways of also conceiving of its hinterland. So one is, of course, within India itself. You know, if you look at the entire East India, including, of course, West Bengal, then Bihar, Jharkhand, UP, Uttarakhand, Madhya Pradesh, etc., etc., going all the way to Punjab and Haryana in the West, you do have a huge hinterland um, to connect with. 
And of course, that's inland. Then what about Nepal and Bhutan, the countries outside India? These are two uh, possibilities of India connecting, uh, sorry, Calcutta connecting with an extended hinterland. And of course, we know that um, the, both the Kolkata and the Haldia ports um, serve uh, Bhutan and Nepal as well. And these connections are not just in terms of maritime space, but roads and rail as well. Now, then there's of course all these big plans to develop a corridor, an industrial corridor, a long corridor that runs all the way from east to west uh, that will reach Amritsar on the one end um, and connecting um, Kolkata on the other, crossing several states. Now, this freight corridor, um, once it happens, um, would in fact uh, offer tremendous possibilities because that would be a, po a port kind of uh, at one end and 